Thank you, Adam, for that great introduction. I'm going to just start out by talking a little bit about me and why I'm here and so excited to be here with you today. Um, if a few of you have been looking at my Twitter stream, this is probably the conference that I've been tweeting the most about coming to. Um, oh, and these are my, uh, my Twitter handle is, is that funny Karen and uh, uh, conservancies is that. So if you're looking at your devices, I know you're totally tweeting about how awesome this talk is. <laughs> um, so, uh, as Adam said, I'm Executive Director of Conservancy, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, a little bit later. Um, I'm also a lawyer, which sometimes when I announce, especially at tech conferences, I have to hide behind the podium to hide from all of the rotten fruit that gets thrown. I'm just kidding. But I'm only a lawyer for, uh, for, uh, for pro bono projects now, um, and I only provide legal advice to, to charitable organizations. Um, I'm super into free and open source software, and I am uh, also a, a patient. So, uh, and this is one of, the, one of the, the main reason why I'm so passionate about this and why I'm so passionate about Bro is that I literally have a big heart. <laughs> My heart is three times the size of a normal person's heart. It's a little bit of an exaggeration. It's three times the thickness of a normal person's heart, um, and it's totally fine. I'm almost always asymptomatic, but I have a very high risk of suddenly dying. Uh, the medical term is called sudden death. And <laughs> literally, like, sudden death. It's hilarious. Uh, and I'm at a 2 to 3% chance per year of suddenly dying, and that's compounding. And I was diagnosed at age 30. So the risk of me dying over that decade and, and just over any of the next decades is, is prohibitively high. And, uh, and so I went to a battery of cardiologists who, uh, who sent me to an electrophysiologist. And uh, while I was hanging out with the electrophysiologist in his office, he said, well, this is not a problem because you're really mostly just at a risk of, of sudden death. So if we give you a defibrillator, you, you'll, be, you'll be fine because the defibrillator will be like someone's following you around with paddles. And if you get into trouble, it will shock you and it'll be fine. Now, the electrophysiologists in their offices they have a bunch of these in the drawer. So, you know, like they pull them out and they, they, they take them out and they like, the electrophysiologist slid it across the desk at me, sort of like, pick it up. You know, it's small, hold it, it's light, it's not such a big deal, it's not so scary, you know. So I pick it up and my mother is sitting next to me, of course, you know. <laughs> and so I pick it up and I say, okay, well, what does it run? And he looked at me and he said, run? I said, well, you know, I'm a lawyer, but I was a developer before I was a lawyer. And, you know, what, 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 what did they, this has software? And what, what software is on it? And he said, software? <laughs> and I had to explain to this extremely educated and, you know, and, and, you know, a specialist who literally implants sometimes several of these per day, right? I had to explain to him that these devices have software on them and that, in fact, that software controls how they operate. And that because this device is set to shock me in my heart, I might care about what that software is on that device. So he says, OK, well, I'm, I've, nobody has ever asked me this before. But you're right. This sounds like a very important point. So you're in luck. Because today, at this doctor's office, right now, is Tom. And Tom is a rep for Medtronic, a medical device company. And I said, oh, great. So he calls out in the hallway, Tom, come on in. So Tom comes in, and, and he says, I am happy to answer any questions you have about this device. And I said, what does it run? And he said, run. <laughs> and we went through the whole conversation again, and nobody had asked Tom about the software on these devices. And all of a sudden, I started to get the idea that this was kind of a problem, right? So Tom says, Oh, this isn't. This is not to worry. I'm a specialist to answer all of the questions that the doctors have, but there are technicians that are at our like, you know, on our on call with our company, and you can call them, and they will give you whatever information you need, right? Like that. The, just call this hotline, and 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 they'll get you through to engineering, and you can answer whatever questions. I'm sure that you can find out everything you want to know. It's like, okay, great. So I go home, and I call this number, and I get into like phone tree hell, you know, like where I keep getting bounced around the company and I leave messages and I get no answer. And, um, and so I say, well, maybe this is just Medtronic. So I call the other two major manufacturers in the medical, on these medical devices and I call them all and nothing. And eventually 
I started to get kind of desperate. I started you know, saying that I would sign a non-disclosure agreement because I thought maybe that was the reason nobody was talking to me, was that they were afraid somehow I was going to want to do something with their you know, corporate secrets, and still nothing. I really wasn't sure what to do. Um, I wasn't sure if I wanted proprietary software. <laughs> this is uh, Bill Gates is a Borg for anyone who. Uh, <laughs> um, it was a picture that used to make the rounds on the internet in the old days, um, <laughs> and so uh, and so I wasn't sure if that if, you know it was it was really upsetting to think about and to think that I could have source code implanted in my body that I wouldn't have access to was appalling. It was appalling that I couldn't even review it. But uh, oh. Did I ever get an answer to which question? So the question is if I ever got an answer to a question. Question is too much. OK, so, uh, so eventually, when I talked to Medtronic um, and other medical device manufacturers, they said, well, it's our proprietary software, and we don't feel that we. So uh, I have, I've got a number of different responses, depending on who I talked to in the company. And I didn't really get an official answer that I could necessarily quote. But, the, uh, but the, the answers that I got, and I'm not going to name Medtronic specifically here because some people stuck their necks out for me um, inside the different companies to tell me information about these devices because they felt bad that, and especially uh, there were uh, developers who felt bad that they understood the feeling of having to have software in your body and not having access to it. So some people started to tell me information that I think they probably shouldn't have. Um, and at, at different companies. And I told them, you know, as a lawyer, I was like, please don't tell me anything about, from your company. Um, but uh, but the, I think the upshot is that the reports about the software are published on the, uh, like, are, like, so there's quality reports that the FDA has, um, but they don't talk, they, there's no reference to the software itself. So, uh, so what I did was I decided I needed to get the device uh, but I was going to launch research into, um, you know, into the uh, what kind of safety and efficacy because the the, the the response is it's safe because it's FDA approved. We have good quality. <laughs> Someone's laughing. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it it goes through a process. We wouldn't put our patients at risk. So you know, um, and so that's pretty much what the companies say. But when, of course, when uh, when I started looking into what the FDA does. The FDA typically doesn't review the source code on these devices. They review reports that are made about the quality of the software and the testing done on the software, reports that are either done by or commissioned by generally the company itself, um, which doesn't seem like the best oversight to me. Um, but they typically don't review the code unless there's something very, very wrong with the, um, and it's a very unusual case. And uh, they, they, they are just starting to promulgate clear requirements about, uh, about software, but there are no real requirements, just guidelines, um, which I also found really surprising. But perhaps we're still coming from my perspective, there's no public repository of the software, right? Like the software, the, the software is kept by the company, so if there's catastrophic failure at Medtronic, just to pick on Medtronic again, um, you know, we're, we're kind of out of luck. Um, so these battery, these devices are only as good as their battery life, right? And they're only so if there's if there's a problem, I have to get a whole other device implanted, and that's surgery, um, and uh, and I'm I'm due for another one soon. So um, so anyway, so I, I got the defibrillator because the risk of suddenly dying was just too much, right? Like every time I wouldn't call my mother back <laughs> for like, two hours, she would freak out that I was some you know that I had suddenly died. And there was one time when I was at brunch with a friend of mine, and she said, so how's it going with the whole defibrillator thing? And I said, oh, you know, I just, like, it'd be so weird to get proprietary software in my body. Like, software I can't see in my body, that's so weird. And she started to cry. And she was like, I don't know what you're even talking about. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. But it is so beyond the fact that you could die tomorrow and no one will help you. And there's no, you know, when you could simply get this device. And I decided that she was right. And so I got the device and I became a cyborg lawyer, which is a terrifying concept, I admit. <laughs> um, and I decided to launch a big initiative on the safety and efficacy of medical devices. So it became a big part of what I did. And what I found out will probably not surprise anybody in this room 
which is that software has bugs, right? Like every, all software has bugs. And the Software Engineering Institute estimates that for every 100 lines of code, one bug is introduced. And, uh, and a study that looked specifically at software that was devices that were recalled due to software errors um, from the, through the FDA, that 98% of those software failures would have been prevented with all Paris testing. So it's really amazing stuff. And then, uh, and then as, I started, uh, as I started speaking about this and talking about this, um, a study was published um, where they showed that these defibrillators are in fact, and pace pacing maker defibrillators are in fact vulnerable to attack. Probably not surprising to many of you. So uh, this is a study where they implanted one of these in a, um, in a bag of meat. <laughs> so that's like a bag of bacon. <laughs> and then there's a defibrillator very much like mine. Actually, I, uh, I was really worried about these issues. And, uh, and so I managed to find an electrophysiologist who really understood my problem. Most of them sort of looked at me blankly. And aside from just saying software, we're also <laughs> like, uh, we're sort of like, you're a conspiracy theorist. You are crazy. Why do you think that anyone would attack you? Why should you care about this? You're overreacting, and you've watched too much television. Like, I've got all of these things. I finally found an electrophysiologist who, who understood where I was coming from, and he said, you really need this device, but I understand what you're nervous about. So uh, because these devices are broadcasting, you know, because I was sort of saying, these devices right now have the worst of both worlds, right? We've got no real security on them at all. They're just, you know, broadcasting unencrypted all the time. And, and the, the software is closed and proprietary, and there's no, you know, no ability to review it. And, and you know, the, at this time, when I first started working, out, working on this, the people started arguing things like, it will be less secure if we can examine the code. You know, things that we know, security through security arguments that we all here in this room know are completely bunk, right? And so, uh, and so it was hard to get any traction on it, but, I, but my electrophysiologist said, I understand what you're, what you're saying, and so I got a device. So just so you all know, my device does not have 802.11 on it. <laughs> my device is not, does not have a wireless component to it. You, you can only uh, interact with it you via... Know, Magnetic, <laughs> magnetic coupling, so you got to get real close. Okay? <laughs> but I'm, I'm due for a new one, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but so during that time, there was a study that, uh, that, that showed with, uh, some, uh, so with a white hat hackers who showed that, uh, that they could interfere uh, and take over control of these devices. So the one that my dad had, for example, is the one they used in the, um, in the study, which was just the model after mine. Um, and, uh, and it could be controlled such that it could, be, uh, it could not only deliver a, uh, a fatal dosage shock, right? Not only that, but also you could take it over to do more subtle things with it, like to put it in testing mode, which runs down its battery. And again, these devices are only as good as the battery. So you run down the battery, suddenly somebody needs surgery to get it replaced or to interfere with pacing or for example, to get personal information that was included in the <laughs> information on the device, like the patient's social security number and doctor's name. Yeah, so pretty terrible stuff. And still, after that, still doctors told me I was a conspiracy theorist, right? Amazing. So, uh, so you know, once I realized how bad it is in medical devices, I started thinking about software generally. And, uh, and it's really a very short walk from a device you rely on for your health to the device you rely on for your health and safety, like a car. So the premium class car has about 100 million lines of code in it. So if we take the uh, Software Engineering Institute estimate of one in 100 lines of code uh, be introducing a bug, even if a majority of the bugs are, 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 are found, one million defects are introduced. So. Uh, Statistically, so surely there are still bugs, and 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 this is a uh, study where they showed that they could take the, the car hacks are so awesome. If you guys haven't seen them, you should totally look online. Uh, they're so fun to watch those videos. This one I loved in particular. This is one of the first ones, but this one I love because you can see that the car believes it's going 140 miles per hour, but it's in park. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it, it, the display was also, uh, uh, you know, just adjusted to say that they were. Pwned by Car Shark, which was the name of the, the, the group that was doing the research on it. And so 
once you sort of start to see that all of our software is vulnerable, it's a very short walk from cars to voting machines, voting machines to um, stock markets to basically anything that, uh, that is society critical. But now, of course, we live in an internet of things, right? Where everything talks to everything else, which means that we don't even know, we, we're only as safe as our weakest link, right? Like nobody is hacking into cars directly through the brake system, right? You go through the entertainment system or, or more commonly for that study, the wheel maintenance system, right? Which is, you know, talking to dealers about the dealers about like when your tires need air, you need to be replaced or whatever. Um, so an internet of things, you don't really know what's connect, you know, what the vulnerabilities are going to be, and so I don't need to, I don't need to tell this audience about that. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but you know, what is society and life critical software is not as obvious as it was before. We don't really. It's much harder to anticipate where our vulnerabilities are and where our phones are talking to our security systems and are talking to our even our medical devices. Suddenly, all software starts to feel like my heart device software, right? All of it seems to, starts to become extremely important and extremely relevant um, and something very much to worry about. Um, and so that is sort of my journey of why I believe that software is something to be passionate about. And because free and open source software is better and safer over time, um, usually when I give this talk to lay audiences, I have a whole discussion about why freedom is like, why open source is so important and better. But you all know that because you're already here. Um, but, uh, and you know about how security through obscurity simply doesn't work, right? And so I started to move from being a sort of a lawyer who thought that open source was cool to being someone who wanted to work on increasing software freedom and software transparency everywhere. Um, and so uh, I'm a co-founder of the Software Freedom Conservancy, and we're the uh, nonprofit home of 40 software free and open source software projects, including Bro with the... I guess it's the old logo, so we maybe should uh, 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 should change it. But uh, but including uh, uh, it's in good company with like Git and Samba and Wine um, and QEMU uh, and Selenium and PyPy. Um, and we also run Outreachy, which is a uh, internship program for women and other underrepresented groups in free and open source software. Um, so uh, and and through that, I I work with our software projects to make sure that they're, um, you know, they're working to improve the situation for free and for software and technology generally and um, promoting uh, free and open source software alternatives in order to make sane technology for a sane world. So once upon a time, really uh, October of 2014, I got an email from Adam. I was looking in my records. <laughs> and. Um, and, and Adam was looking around at the different foundations, I think, and he found conservancy. Um, and what he said he was looking for was signifying longevity for the project, um, clarifying managing IP rights, and accepting donations for the project with low overhead, uh, to build community with trust and transparency, and to provide some legal protection for contributors. And this is sort of what he was looking for. And he suggested we have a call to discuss to, to figure out whether or not Conservancy was a good home. And I immediately was like super, super excited because from where I'm coming from, security and free software go hand in hand. You can't have good security in the long run without building on an open base. It's, it, it's all security researchers agree that this is the case. If you look at the, the honeymoon effect, um, all the other studies that come out, um, while free and open source software isn't necessarily better and safer from the get-go, or, or you know, no software is truly safe, really. Um, only free and open source software has the potential to become uh, safer over time. And all the studies show that free and open source software behaves in a, uh, in a, in a better way over time with vulnerabilities um, uh, as opposed to, uh, to, to bugs. Um, and so uh, we looked at all of the things that, uh, that Adam and the, uh, the leadership committee were looking to find within an organization, and uh, we were excited to find that we had a good match. Looking at the longevity of the project is something that's, um, that's incredibly important, and I think was a huge step uh, affiliating with a foundation shows a willingness to put control in a, in a neutral, and in our case, charitable, um, charitable place that looks for looks forward to the future and gives everyone a chance to invest in the project um, in an in an equal way, and showing that shows that there's 
not an effort to keep the software controlled by one entity for monetization, which gives you the ability to trust it a little bit more. With a foundation like Conservancy, we manage the legal stuff. We used to say in all of our materials that we handle the boring stuff so that hackers can hack. Um, and it's a little catchy. Um, I think it's a real oversimplification. But, um, but with Conservancy, we definitely have a synergy because all of our projects have many of the same needs. You know, overall, we, we have projects, like lots of our projects have conferences. And so now we know how to negotiate with hotels for, you know, for, for having their conferences. So things like that that you don't even think about, but then also things, anything that might be confusion about licensing. And Conservancy is somewhat known for enforcing the GPL on behalf of uh, Linux kernel developers who want them to be enforced. But we've also had some of our permissively licensed projects ask us to enforce their permissive license because the notices were not quite right, which meant that people didn't know that there was free, you know, like, so, uh, so managing legal stuff of, and many of our, our, our projects are, uh, are permissive, uh, permissively licensed like Bro, and, uh, and many of them like really have no interest in enforcement, and that's great too. Um, so, uh, but we manage that depending on whatever our projects want or don't want. Uh, we take in donations, and I don't want to dwell too much on this because Adam already talked about it, and I think there's going to be more about it later. Um, but we can, uh, we Conservancy can take in donations for the project, and when they're, they're given to Conservancy, you know that in order for them to be spent, they have to be spent on things that are consistent with a nonprofit mission, with a charitable mission. So it has to benefit the free and open source software uh, that is bro. So there's, uh, there's oversight with that donations. There's infrastructure around it. Um, and then there's also efficiency because the, uh, the bro leadership committee doesn't have to re-implement everything um, themselves every time they want to do something. Um, trust and transparency is one of the key things. And I tell you, I have been so impressed with bro and the attitude and the professionalism of the leadership committee um, they are, actually, raise your hands if you're a part of the leadership committee and you're here. So let's just applaud the leadership committee because that is really important work. And this leadership committee really understands sort of the, the long-term goals of a free and open source software project and uh, putting good infrastructure in place. And I think it's, it's very impressive. So coming into Conservancy shows sort of shared values around uh, around openness. It sort of shows uh, a, a freedom, uh, a freedom approach, a, a, a collaboration, sort of a, 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 a uh, about, so how many people here are part of the core development team? So is it sort of, yeah, okay. And how many people here have had some of their code upstreamed in Bro? So like a few more people. So uh, having a, having software that is available for everybody to use. Oh, how many people have only started using Bro in the last year? So like actually kind of like a quarter of the audience. That's really amazing. Uh, having software that's available for anyone to use, for anyone to improve and to, um, to contribute those changes back. Also having a software available for anyone to see is really important. And there are different ways of accomplishing that goal, different approaches. So with copyleft projects, they use their license to compel people to contribute back. With permissively licensed projects, you use the, the social community, you use the benefits that you get over time, and you understand that to have a vibrant community that creates this software that so many people want to use and deploy and improve for themselves, improving it together means that we all have those improvements. And it means that there's the, the community will grow even further and everyone will benefit. So there are different mechanisms to do that, but the shared values are the same. The shared values of contributing together, of working together, and of having software that anyone can pick up and run with is, um, is incredibly important. As Adam was saying, it's been a really exciting year uh, with joining Conservancy about a year ago um, and, uh, and with the Mozilla grant. So there's a lot of really exciting things uh, going on in the Bro community. This conference keeps growing. Um, I think in the last three years, it's grown, you were saying, like 100%. Started <laughs> out 50, and now it's at 185. So really, really impressive growth. 
So having a foundation for the project was one key step. Um, it's definitely a key step, but it's only one step toward these goals that, uh, that the Borough leadership team has and that the Borough community has generally. Um, in order to accomplish this true trust and transparency over time and this true collaboration, it, it, it all comes down to you. So everybody here who is, is using Bro um, and is customizing it, keep in mind that you should, you know, that you can advocate for upstreaming your contributions too, whether you're in an academic environment or in a corporate environment, and that by, con by contributing back your changes, you help keep Bro vibrant and you help invest Bro and make it even better. If uh, I think next year, those people who have raised their hands, who have contributed back, I bet it's going to be double. And it basically comes down to all of you investing and, uh, and understanding that, uh, that making changes and upstreaming them are important. And if you ever have a situation where you think that you've made changes to Bro that you would like to see contributed back, but you don't know how to bring that up with your employer or you don't know how to make that case, um, you can call me. <laughs> I'd be happy to help. Uh, it's not, it's a very difficult conversation to have the first time. And after that, it becomes easy. You can show the benefits and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's very easy to also make the, the business cases for it. So uh, this has been my, my tag that I've been using for coming to the conference is better kind of bro because people were sort of saying, BroCon, that sounds interesting. <laughs> um, and you know, as I said, we run the internship program for uh, for women. Uh, it's it's for women globally and uh, uh, people of color in the in, in the U.S. who are uh, uh, underrepresented in U.S. tech. And so we have uh, basically paid internships for people to participate in that. So uh, so half of my Twitter followers are people who are are really concerned with uh, you know codes of conduct and diversity. And so, and so I was getting a lot of like, you know, digitally raised eyebrows on <laughs> and promoting something bro. And then it's really exciting because in fact, this community does so many of the things that need, you know, that are, so, uh, you know, having a code of conduct uh, was put up right away for the conference and it's right on the first page um, is really great. When you go to the, the, uh, the Bro website, you're immediately presented with a, with a tutorial and with explanations of what the project is and how to use it. So things that are, are for inclusivity generally also help with other diversity. And so uh, I have to say that I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm like a broken record saying how impressed I am with the Bro community, but, uh, but I was so excited to come here um, because of all of those things. And so I started saying that, that this is a better kind of bro uh, because uh, it's a fun way of turning that term into a, uh, a brand to get more people involved. So uh, uh, to, to sort of uh, wrap up, because uh, I wanted to leave time for questions, um, about three million people worldwide have pacemakers. And every year, 600,000 are implanted. And this is just pacemakers. This isn't insulin pumps, which have also been shown to be vulnerable, or pain management, right? As diagnostic tools get cheaper and as the devices themselves get cheaper, you're gonna, like, everyone's gonna know someone who has one. And as our technology becomes more integrated and more lightweight, we're all going to become cyborgs if we're lucky enough right? Like all of us are going to rely on technology, um, certainly externally, but probably internally for all, you know, in, in the not too distant future. And so we have to care about software freedom. And Bro as a security project is one of the most, these are some of the most important work that, uh, that can be done. So I implore you to think and care about freedom and to continue contributing to projects that are uh, free and open source software license for your future cyborg self. Thank you. So, uh, oh, I also have like a, uh, this is freely licensed, feel free to use it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, 
Uh, also, uh, Conservancy itself has a supporter program, so you can support the overall mission in all of our projects by becoming a supporter. Our, uh, our member project, we, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal that uh, Conservancy takes 10% of donations that come in, but all of the money that comes in from our projects does not pay for all the work we do for all of our projects. Um, and so uh, we do, we fundraise separately to help support that work. And, uh, and so that's where supporters uh, come in. So, uh, uh, you know, you can donate, donate to Bro uh, first and then, and then also become a supporter if you have the funds. But who has questions? How many software updates have I had? Uh, just two. Just two so far. Yeah. So, uh, so, and, and I, I was, I was kind of um, uh, picking on Medtronic, um, but the reason why I got a Medtronic device was because my, uh, my doctors liked Medtronic because they felt like Medtronic had better support, but more importantly, were very responsive when there was a problem. Um, and so, uh, but there are things that Medtronic will never worry about that I care about. So, for example, uh, I was recently pregnant, and while pregnant, I was shocked twice. While my heart was doing things that ordinary pregnant women's hearts do, there just aren't a lot of women who have defibrillators who are pregnant, right? Like it's, I, I, I live in New York City, and I went to uh, Roosevelt Hospital, and, which is a big, giant hospital in New York City. And uh, the head of the high-risk practice that I was in, or rather one of the doctors that I had who was very senior in the high-risk practice, had only ever had one patient ever before with a defibrillator. And all she sees are patients that are high risk. And I said, because I, I had noticed something, and so I had said, oh, next time you have a patient with a defibrillator, and she started laughing. She was like, you're probably going to be my last patient with a defibrillator. Um, and so in order to deal with the fact that my heart did things that normal pregnant women's hearts do, like it raced, raced a little bit from time to time, instead of trying to figure out if there was a way to edit the algorithm on my device. Instead, I wound up taking drugs to slow my heart rate down all the time. And it was so clumsy. I couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs. Um, and you know, it was, I, and the only reason why I was taking those drugs were not for my health, but to prevent my defibrillator from shocking me. And because there was no way to, to, pure, to really customize it for my situation. And it's a perfect example. It's not that Medtronic has no interest in pregnant women getting shocked. I promise you, Medtronic really doesn't want pregnant women getting shocked, but this use case is not on their radar. And by the time I would have made it clear to them that there was a problem, I, they couldn't have made a change in the time that it would have helped me. And there are so few women that need this that it's just simply, you know, whether it would be worth the money and the time to put in that change, you know, and to invest all that resources. And it doesn't matter how much money I have, you know, like I, it would be very difficult for me to hire medical professionals to help me with my situation because I don't have access to the source code. So. So it's the question is, what are the stages of maturity uh, that, uh, for conservancy projects and for projects that come into a fiscal sponsor? Um, and I'd say that I give you a lawyerly answer and say it depends. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's different in many ways for different projects. But there are some things we see. So for conservancy, we have an evaluations committee that, um, that is full of like uh, free and open source software luminaries who look at a project and decide if it's a good fit to join conservancy. And we have certain criteria that we use to see if a project is a good fit. One of those is that the project has reached a certain level of maturity. It can't be just like one person's project. It has to have some community, some contributions. It can't be, um, you know, it, 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 it can't be thrown over the wall by one company. It has to, um, you know, have enough contributors to be, uh, so usually projects only come to conservancy when there's money at play in some way. So it could be really small, like they could have joined Google Summer of Code, for example, and uh, was, were getting the $500 per student mentor payments and needing a place to put that, and none of the, you know, the individual didn't want to take that money and pay taxes on it and whatever, so, uh, and also be responsible for it. So that's also a time when projects come in to uh, a, a nonprofit home. Um, it, it really varies. I'd say that 
the Bro project was a little bit more mature than a lot of the projects that come into Conservancy, um, but, uh, but we won't take a project that isn't further down the line. Yeah, it is. I can send you the link to it if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there have been a couple of other studies since then. This guy named um, Barnaby Jack uh, actually listened to me. This is so cool. Like, you don't usually get to the chance to influence your, uh, your destiny like this a bit. But, uh, but this guy, Barnaby Jack, he was famous for hacking into ATMs. So he would do these, like, uh, these, like uh, big expo type things where he would, you know, he would... You basically would get the ATM to flash, to like spit out money. And his last name was Jack, Barnaby Jack. And he would get it to flash jackpot. And he would call it jackpotting. And he would get it to spit out the money. He would basically show vulnerabilities in a very showmanship kind of way. And he started working on um, medical devices. And he showed that using an iPhone in a public space, you could take over um, control in, to, to deliver a, uh, a lethal dosage through an insulin pump or a fatal shock. And so uh, I was totally a fan. And so I, I record an Oddcast, a odd, podcast Oddcast, uh, <laughs> uh, where I was talking about, uh, he, he had just announced some of his work. And I was saying, oh, there's this guy, Barnaby Jack, and he's doing such cool work. And I'm so excited because finally I'll be able to show how vulnerable these devices are. And people will take this a little bit more seriously. And I got an email from him saying that he only thought to work on it because he heard me talk about it. And I was like, ah. Oh. And then because of his work, I'm pretty sure that Dick Cheney asked for his wireless component to be turned off in hardware, which is really fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, which is cool because now there, there, there was press that, that Dick Cheney didn't feel safe with his wireless component. So the last I heard, any patient that wanted to have their wireless component disabled in hardware could get it disabled. So I'm excited because I am just about in need of another device, and I got the last sterile magnetic coupling only device in the New York City area and that was many years ago or not many but that was a number of years ago I my device is is due for uh, replacement early in part because of the unnecessary shocks that I have gotten <laughs> and the wasted power from the three shocks that I have received that I didn't actually need so so uh, but it's exciting because it means that I I in some indirect way help my situation, but it's very indirect. But yeah, so he, he started to, to, to do all these really, and then he mysteriously died um, like two years ago um, at age of 31. Um, and uh, we, there are a lot of people who have conspiracy theorists, theories about him, him dying uh, like two weeks before he was going to disclose a lot of the information around these, uh, these hacks that he was doing. So, uh, but there's a lot of information out there, and, uh, and the CAR study is also available. They didn't release all of the specifics of how they accomplished the attacks because they, didn't, they wanted to be responsible about the disclosure of information, but it's enough that you can see that they use just over the counter equipment to do it. Any other questions? You've got a really, really awesome conference. Thanks for inviting me here, and uh, have a great time. <laughs>